Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 804. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's May 30th, 2023. All right, thank you for joining us for another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We are very glad you could be here. We know the show is all about the audience. It's just kind of about what we want to talk about. Uh, this is a show where Kevin and George sit down in front of our webcams, and we talk about Anglican news, Christian news, politics, and whatever else we find interesting. And uh, you guys, for some reason, like that, and we appreciate that very much. Before we get too far into the show, I always want to remind people this is a great chance to like us on facebook and youtube it's free advertising for us uh if you have not subscribed yet please subscribe to the show if you want to add your opinion to the, all the topics we talk about you go to the comment section and you say hey you guys are wrong about this or right about that or i agree with you that's that's a perfect place for it george we had a lot of comments discussing fishmongers yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I did not know there were so many ichthyologists among our viewers that uh, who had uh, real, real academic interest in the science of slicing and dicing fish. No. Um, it, uh, it's quite extraordinary, the people who watch Anglican Unscripted. <laughs> I thought it was good advice. You know, uh, Jesus was a carpenter and we we're supposed to be fishers of men. And you know, I, I think that, that was cute. And that's exactly what the comment section is for. And we really appreciate that. George, how are you doing this week? You, you finally settled back. You, you spent 10 days in Kigali, uh, 10 or 11 days in Rome. <sighs> Sigh. Um, you're back in Florida. How's, how are things catching up there? I should never leave. I should never leave because when I go away, everything falls apart. We had a whole bunch of people die. I had every weekend I've Ooh. had funerals. My mm -hmm. uh, 107 year old person who I visited at the nursing home passed away. The oldest lady in the county, she passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've got, and it's also the same time of year when people uh, head back up north so that fewer hands to do the same amount of work that needs to be done. Because the grass doesn't grow in the winter, it grows a foot a week, it seems, in the it summer. <laughs> and all the guys are gone. So mm -hmm. who's going to cut the grass on Thursday? Or somebody's moved back up north and need help emptying out their storage unit. Now, these days, the teenagers in the ch church, they don't they don't want to they don't want to make money. They don't want they don't want to be paid to do manual labor. I don't know what it is with kids these days. And so I try to cajole 80 year old men. Oh, come on, Phil, you still got what it takes. Help me empty this, uh, <laughs> empty this storage unit and move, uh, move this grand piano. So you see six guys all with trusses and me trying to lift a grand piano to the back of a trailer. Mm -hmm. So, oh my, it's just, well, it's great to be needed, but at the same time, I wish I was a good enough administrator that I had created a machine that could carry on and I didn't have to do this stuff. I think that's a that's not a um, big skill within the clergy, the ability to uh, have that synergy. Hey, I'm leaving. I expect everything to just keep going while I'm gone. And they come back and, yeah, w what you see is like you, uh, you, know, you leave the teenagers for uh, a weekend and they order pizza every night and there's pizza boxes everywhere and, you know, it's... This is how it works in, in the ministry as well. All right. Well, we got a lot of stories here to cover. Let's start with the, the biggest story of the week. And according to PBS and the BBC, the BBC World News Service and CNN and everybody else, the biggest story of the century is Uganda has changed its laws regarding homosexual practice. And I'm going to use the word and groomers. Um, let's do, let's talk about it. Uh, let's not make the story about Kevin and George, but let's talk about the Ugandan story, George. President Museveni signed a bill after having returned it once to the Ugandan parliament that uh, reforms the country's sodomy laws that were from the British colonial era. And it's caused a great deal of uh, noise in the West because some of it includes uh, provisions for the death penalty for aggravated uh, homosexual rape and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, Church of Uganda put out a statement backing the uh, the law, 
And I just need to say that it passed by like a 95% margin in Parliament. Now, I want to step back and say, what is going on here? Because too often uh, people in America view the world in an American lens, that uh, they, they look at something that happens in another culture and interpret it according to our norms. What this is, is not so much about homosexuality as it is about colonialism. Um, Uganda's had essentially the same sorts of laws that, that, and hasn't really changed. But what it hasn't had is the, until recently is pressure from the United States, from the European Union, from Britain to adopt the Western agenda on human sexuality. And this is very offensive, uh, basically say, and the, the Ugandan people find it very patronizing. For a uh, and essentially there are things that you can point to. At a, one time, Uganda was a destination for sex tourism. Mm -hmm. And there were a number of cases about 10, 15 years ago of European men coming to Uganda and, uh, so, you know, and little, being provided with boys. Well, that was cleaned up. But that, uh, my, that the memories of those extraordinary incidences, which were not common, they were rare, colors the conversation. And plus now you have educational materials, say from the Gates Foundation or for the UN, that promote uh, not only homosexuality, but transgenderism and the whole Western sexual ethos. And for a conservative society like Uganda, this is abhorrent. So both Christians and Muslims and animists in Uganda all sort of rallied around and said enough is enough. And we're going to stick our finger in the eyes of the West by putting out this law. One thing I should say, um, now, I'm not giving a personal commentary. I'm trying to explain how the Ugandans see this. Because when you have a situation where maybe 95, 99% of the country is in favor of something, and you think it's appalling, usually that's a sign that you're missing or not understanding something. So either 95 to 99% of the Ugandan people are monsters, according to our lights, or we're not getting something. Mm -hmm. The uh, Ugandan law are, li are like Italian bus schedules, I found. When I was in Rome, I had to get around by bus because I'd be crazy to try to rent a car in Rome. And what I found was that what the 212, that was an aspiration. The bike bus might get there at 202, might get there at 315. It might never come because the drivers have done a half day strike. It, the schedule was an aspiration. Laws like these laws passed in Uganda are aspirations. They uh, are not rigorously enforced. I don't believe there's been a prosecution under the old sodomy laws. I don't know if ever, at least not in the last two or three generations. Maybe so a, I, on a local level, but certainly not uh, something that's made uh, the national press. So what what this means is that how we understand laws is not necessarily how Ugandans understand laws. Mm -hmm. And this is more a statement of protest against a Western worldview that countenances no, no uh, disagreement. Now, I would like to juxtapose that about countries who have uh, anti-homosexual laws who do uh, prosecute and uh, murder homosexuals, Saudi Arabia, uh, Pakistan, Turkey, where they throw them off buildings. You're not seeing that in Uganda. You're not seeing this. You know, what we see here is always in the West an overreaction to uh, something we hear or read about uh, in Africa or uh, overseas. Uh, I remember just hearing over and over again, if we overturn Roe v. Wade, women will die. Okay, well, I've not seen any dead women because Roe v. Wade was overturned. Not one. You know, it, it, we just had this perpetual, uh, you know, lie between the right and the left about the reality of the situation. Here, uh, Uganda is protesting 
uh, certainly cl colonialism in, in one way, but they also see what's happening here in, in America, in the West, with LGBTQ plus spirit plus second spirit. I don't know. I can't even uh, get them. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but they keep changing it. And my old brain doesn't work that fast. And in as such, they look and say, you guys, you, you're falling apart. We don't want any part of that. And I can understand that. We don't just have... Uh, advocacy we have groomers people who go into our schools and actively groom and uh, try to uh, convince people that they're gender fluid that there's a spectrum to gender that if they have any uh, dysphoria at all about their bob uh, their bible about their body it's because they're probably likely uh, the wrong gender and that can be changed so if i'm over in uganda and say we how do we stop that from ever coming to our country this is probably the law for that, George. Well, I understand these legislation to be the Ugandan mm -hmm. response to the madness of the West. Yeah. And it is what it is. More strange news. Uh, Sirius Pittman, he was a uh, bishop within the uh, Anglican Church in Canada, has moved to the ANIC, ANIC. I see this as good news, although surprising news. Yes, and uh, Kevin, you've given the Persian pronunciation of Cyrus, uh, Sirius. Uh, oh, sorry. Cyrus Pittman. <laughs> but sorry. in Iran, you in Iran you say Sirius. Uh, yeah, he's Pittman, right. uh, uh, Bishop, I think, Eastern Newfoundland. Uh, well, this yeah, is an odd that, yeah. story yeah. because while he was bishop, Cyrus Pittman was an advocate for the gay movement within the Anglican Church of Canada. He voted in favor of it at, at meetings of General Synod. He encouraged uh, gay uh, clergy to come and serve in his diocese. And now he's had a change of heart in retirement. He surrendered his license and has now been accepted into the Anglican network in Canada as a retired bishop to serve as needed. Now, this is not merely a case of I'm mad at the Anglican Church of Canada because the logical step if you're mad at something isn't to join something that represents what you were opposed to for a great part of your ministry. So I think here we're seeing some sort of change of heart. Prayer? Did prayer change Cyrus Pittman's views? Hmm. Um, why did this happen? We won't know, but Cyrus Pittman has moved uh, to the side of the angels, it seems, in hmm. his retirement. Well, he was re attending a Anic church, got involved, and hey, uh, good. I, I, I. We need more of these stories where uh, people who were—I uh, don't want to say on the wrong side—on a different side uh, of history have moved to the correct side of history. And, I and also, that. also Anic. It's pretty. Uh, Anic. Anic is. I think they like Anic better. Yeah, Anic. Yeah. Anic is. Uh, pretty sophisticated and they just won't take somebody and make him a, and receive him as a bishop just as a trophy i mean if he still stood for what he stood for when he was a, an aca bishop they'd receive him as a layperson gladly they may license him as a local priest but to accord him the honor of being a retired bishop within anic um shows that they checked him out before taking him on board mm -hmm. interesting all right okay yeah, we're going to go over to uh, the Church of England for our next story. Uh, and the Diocese of Chichester, I just got to put this here on screen for you. Um, David Renshaw has been arrested and now jailed for possessing indecent images on his uh, electronic devices. And this is quite a story, George. Um, because I'm seeing not just elements of stupidity, but evil. Yeah, I mean... You might ask yourself, the way, there will there will always be stories of bad clergy. That's just a staple. It's, you know, something that we're always going to do. But there's something about the level of evil in this particular story that speaks to me so strongly of satanic and demonic influences. Here's a priest, parish priest in Worthing, in southeastern England, the Diocese of Chichester, who is a methamphetamine addict uh he also checks himself with various other narcotics 
He uh, is into child pornography, into bestiality, and on satanic chat groups where he boasts about wanting to sacrifice a child to the devil. We're not talking about some drunk priest who's uh, pestering the ladies in the choir. We're moving to or a whole misusing the checkbook. Yes, yeah. it's different. We're yeah. moving. We're moving to a level of depravity where there's more than just he's a bad boy. I I feel very badly for this fellow. First off, as that there was no oversight, there was no archdeacon, there was no bishop to check in and say, well, why are there dead animals all around your rectory, and why are there pentagons? Uh, pentacles with uh, with uh, uh, dead sheep slaughtered in the middle of them in your backyard. Who was watching this guy? Who was caring for this priest? Where was his wife? Where were his children? I mean, I, maybe they just thought this was normal behavior for a Church of England country victor. I don't know, but nobody was there for him. And the Ooh. evil that he got into, whether it started with pornography or whether it started with narcotics, led to his complete and utter destruction, such that before sentencing, he attempted to kill himself, was unsuccessful. He's now going to serve four years, which means in England he can get out in two years. Lucky the guy wasn't in the United States because this would have been a 20-year sentence for him. He would never have gotten out effectively at this age of life, stage of life. Sure. Well, the investigating officer, uh, Detective Sergeant David Rose, said throughout this investigation, Renshaw sought to blame anyone but himself. He failed to accept or take any responsibility for his actions. While I'm certain the local parish he re represented would be appalled by that. Who's his bishop? You know, I, I, I have questions. Uh, David Warner. Um, uh, well... Uh, on Twitter, I subscribed to the Diocese of Chichester's Twitter feed, and mm -hmm. I got a little thing saying from the Diocese of Chichester that uh, June is Pride Month. And here are all the Pride activities and all the rainbow stuff, and there we're, going to be, we're going to have a float in the Brighton Pride Parade. And the bright, Brighton is sort of the key west of Britain. It has uh, uh, an active homosexual subculture there. And so you're going to see men and... Uh, bondage outfits, uh, you know, dressed uh, inappropriately, simulating sexual acts, just like you have in most of these pride parades these days. And the Diocese of Brighton is going to be involved in all this. Now, if that's become normalized, at what point do we stop worrying about poor people like David Renshu who have either through mental illness or narcotic addiction or satanic, demonic uh, oppression are... Uh, have, have crossed the line into utter madness? Yeah, it's a good question, George. Um, not quite completely unrelated. Let's move to South Africa. And we see a diocese down there complain about cholera and that they need people to pray for them because they're, they're moving back from a second-class uh, country to a third-class country. And well, Pretoria was always a first world part of South Africa. Yeah. It's, it's, it was the, uh, I think it was the uh, legislative capital. I'm yeah, not mistaken. Still is. Well, it, uh, I, isn't well, it? Okay. Pretoria, Cape Town, and Johannesburg each had a function of government, but that, that was from high school geography, so it probably has changed. <laughs> the Bishop of Pretoria put out a letter urging prayers for the people of uh, Hammerskrail, I think after a cholera outbreak. Now that that had very little readership on Anglican Inc, that story that went out because, you know, a cholera outbreak in an African place far away. But what this speaks to is the, it, this is emblematic of the utter and complete collapse of South Africa due to the African National Congress and its affirmative action woke agenda. Now, when you, have a, when you have a minority that you seek to empower through affirmative action, as we have in the United States, where uh, uh, certain minorities, African Americans and Hispanics, are given preference, while other minorities, Asians, Chinese, for instance, have a quota at Harvard. They only take so many, uh, and so that a, an African American student will 
have several standard deviation points lower uh, abilities res measured by testing than a Chinese student, you can get away with it. But when the minority is 85% of the country, what happens is that the jobs are given out to unqualified people. Mm -hmm. And so you give, so the, waters, the water department is given a, a political appointment is made and this guy uh, who will be a black African will hire his relatives, his friends, members of his tribe to fill out the positions. And very few of these people are civic or sanitary engineers. And what happens is the water supply collapses. The train system has collapsed in South Africa. The electrical system has collapsed in South Africa. The South African Air Force is all but moribund um, because the uh, appointment of cronies and unqualified people. South Africa likes to uh, say, oh, we're the major power of the African subcontinent. Uh, it's, it's, it is the murder capital of the world. It is. Well, it is what, the United, on, yeah, absolutely, yeah. is what the United States will be if we do not get off the crazy direction we've taken. Just imagine San Francisco or Los Angeles writ nationwide, and you have the situation in South Africa. It's really well, bad. And the Anglican Church there, of course, under Tabo Makoba, uh, you know, he, he, he and his predecessor, and Giancullo and Dungane, uh, are lockstep buddies with the ANC. They're political bishops. And they mm -hmm. only rarely say anything to criticize the powers that be, but give them an opportunity to talk about white oppression and white privilege. They're happy to wander off onto that prairie and go along. But the actual problems facing South Africa, corruption, decadence, uh, destruction of uh, what was built up over 200 years. Church is silent. Well, I mean, I think right now the, the biggest part is cronyism and there's nobody being trained up. I, you know, I don't care if you get the job, but you better be trained into it. And that's just not happening. Uh, these are appointed jobs, um, uh, many political appointees and uh, tribal appointees as well. And uh, it's, it's become a big mess. And, you know... South Africa had a great uh, uh, future ahead of it uh, after apartheid, and I think it's uh, it, it's really it's hard to watch, George. Very hard to watch. Well, we've so. been down this path with Zimbabwe, and yeah, Zimbabwe, it's a great example. And we're not yet at Zimbabwe levels because mm -hmm. uh, uh, they they haven't had a Mugabe to really speed things along. But South Africa, oh, I hate to say this, but get out if you can. Uh, that's a terrible thing to say. Well, it is get because it's a, it's a beautiful country, has many uh, wonderful resources. And initially, they tried to do this right. Uh, th there were people in charge who stopped the riots after the uh, uh, apartheid was overthrown. There are people there, in including the Archbishop, uh, what's his name, was uh, just passed away. Desmond Tutu? Two of you, sorry, uh, was was there to try and keep the peace, and they were able to keep that initial peace, but then since then they've gone down the wrong path so many times, and I I, I don't know what's going to be like in South Africa in ten years. I do know many people have left. Yeah. At, at one time, the South African Anglican Church was a powerhouse. It had uh, leaders not just political ones like Tutu, but Christian leaders, charismatic leaders, evangelical leaders that mm -hmm. really were propounding and teaching the Christian faith, black and white. Mm -hmm. Now, now that's gone. And, you know, I, uh, I spent some time in South Africa, tw it's now been 20, uh, 25 years ago, and I spent some time in the Diocese of Kokstad, uh, and I keep in touch and follow that diocese. And recently, oh, about five, six years ago, the uh, bishop, uh, the first native bishop of that diocese, uh, got in trouble because of uh, keeping the clergy salaries and diverting money to friends and whatnot. And the auditors were sent from Cape Town to check things out. And guess what happened? The cathedral burned down along Fire. with the diocese and offices yeah. before they got there. What is happening to a church? 
that at one time had people like Desmond Tutu to a church where the bishop, oops, arson, now you can't prove anything against me. What's, you know, where the Holy Spirit departed, I think is the only way I can describe it. Now, has it departed from every corner? No, it hasn't. Uh, but it's certainly the power of the Spirit is banked low in the upper reaches and echelons of the South African church. All right, let's move back to America. Uh, we're going to talk about the Diocese of South Carolina. There's a, been a recent final, 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 comma, final Supreme Court decision on the last uh, three buildings that were uh, kind of up for grabs. And this is a long saga. This goes back, you know, to, to Bishop Mark Lawrence, uh, Mark Lawrence, when he was bishop elect and had to be reelected twice uh, because nobody in the Episcopal Church wanted him, even though he said he wasn't taking uh, the diocese out. He had to be forced to take the diocese out. The, the irony of how uh, the Episcopal ch uh, Church treated the diocese and Mark Lawrence uh, will never be fully understood. However, the the diocese of South Carolina has a decision from the Supreme Court that says two of these churches are yours, one goes to Tech, George. Yeah, Old St. Andrews in Charleston and I believe Holy Cross in Statesboro yeah. had initially been assigned to the Episcopal Church by the South Carolina Supreme Court. They asked for a rehearing and appealed and, the South, and it was uh, reversed. They could go with the uh, ACNA and now this final has been this of course was challenged now it's finally been finally been finally settled that these two churches are out of tech however there was a third church uh i think it's good shepherd charleston yeah. um uh also was one of the three who appealed and it was found that they have to stay in tech so now their leadership is either has to walk out or negotiate for some sort of buyout of the property or things of that nature. We'll see what. Well, I visited there, Good. But, uh, yeah, I visited Good Shepherd when I was in Charleston last year. They were meeting in a school, and uh, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen now if they're going to try and buy the property. I, I know that's something that is available through the Tech Bishop and the Acne Bishop. So, but at this stage, it looks like the litigation is. Finally, 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 finally done. So, mm -hmm. praise God, both sides can get on to the business of uh, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's not easy. I mean, you know, taking, as the Apostle Paul would tell you, don't go to court. But once you, you've you escaped the, the legal system and the court system, and these decisions have been finally been made, time to get back to the, to get back to the gospel. Get back to the good news. Get back to sharing it. And y y these wounds will heal. Um, you may still have some scars, but these wounds will heal, and you can get back to being the light and the salt for Charleston, uh, which needs it so bad. Uh, it's a city with a very dynamic, to say the least, history. Let's move on to Hong Kong, George. Um, as we know, they've become under Chinese control again, and... Uh, the Hong Kong Christians are being told how to become Chinese Christians. This is a difficult story to report uh, because of the implications of where it'll take things. After the uh, victory of the communists in 1948, one of the things they did was amalgamate all the Christian churches into two separate groups. The Patriotic Catholic Church, adding all the Catholics together, and the three self uh, the three self. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, the, the three self <laughs> movement. That's it. All the Protestant churches movie, yeah. Yeah. into one group, mm -hmm. uh, basically merging Methodists, Anglicans, Baptists, everybody into all this, and making them official state churches under the China Christian Council. This has been a government. Uh, and at the time, one of the uh, leaders up until the 90s uh, was a former uh, Anglican bishop who basically gave up his Anglican uh, identity in order uh, to be a state functionary. Uh, now, what's happening? 
Well, the leaders of the China Christian Council and the Three Self Protestant Movement went to Hong Kong and had a meeting with the leaders of the Hong Kong churches. And in Hong Kong, you still have Methodists, Baptists, Anglicans, Catholics, the whole thing that you had before the revolution. And they said, now that we're one country, and now that you've had enough time to see how we do things, we're going to start making sure that Hong Kong Christianity is, the phrase they use is Sinicized, meaning made Chinese. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean having services in Chinese? No, it doesn't. It means subordinating their doctrine and discipline to the Communist Party of China, such that in some parts of China, they have taken down the Ten Commandments from church walls and replaced it with sayings from Chairman Mao. They've replaced mm -hmm. icons of saints with pictures of Mao and other, and uh, Chairman and uh, Chairman Xi and other luminaries of the party. The Anglican Archbishop of Hong Kong chaired this meeting and was very cordial and polite. And as the mainland Christian leaders basically said, it's time you fellas got in line and became more Chinese in your Christianity. Which means, uh, and there are a lot of, not, well, there are some major doctrinal problems here for Anglicans who wish to be faithful, such as uh, justification by faith is out the door it's a justification by works that conform with the mind of the Communist Party. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So it's a works it's a works righteousness, but this works righteousness mm -hmm. is mediated through the leadership of the Communist Party. So you are not saved by your faith. Your faith does not make you well. You are saved by your conformance to the dictates of the party, being a good citizen, being a good subject of the state. And then your Christianity may sort of influence all of that on the side. It, so what does this mean? Is that are the, is the Hong Kong church going to have its assets confiscated and moved over to the three self patriotic movement? Maybe. Uh, will the clergy who do not conform go and have to go abroad or go to prison camps? Maybe. It's a bad sign. What we saw happen with the judiciary, what we saw happen with the politics, what we saw happen with the press, uh, it's now going to happen to the churches in Hong Kong. And yeah, recently, owned... Jimmy, Lai, Jimmy, Jimmy Lai, who's a publisher, billionaire, uh, owned some newspapers, has been mm -hmm. was arrested by the communists. And he's even the British Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, made a personal plea last week to let to Jimmy lie out, Chinese couldn't care less. No. He's going to go to prison well, for a good long time. To be a Chinese Christian, Mao has to be your god, and the president of China has to be your, your messiah. Uh, you know, in, in simple terms, you are giving over everything to the party, and the, the party is your Holy Spirit. And you know, it's you. Your only choice, in my opinion, is to go underground. Um, within Hong Kong. And this is what we see in China, where the underground church is 10, 15 times as big as the official churches. Mm -hmm. So will we see Hong Kong Christians go underground to their version of the catacombs, meeting in people's homes and apartments rather than in churches? I don't know. Uh, but I guess what I need, what we need to do as non-Chinese Christians is to pray for the, the Christians of Hong Kong, pray for their leaders, pray that they have the wisdom to handle these attacks and find a way to maintain their integrity and maintain the flock under the assaults of uh, a terrible enemy of Peking. Yes, do pray. I mean, it, okay. And, and folks, we're talking about a lot of good news this week. <laughs> we're, we're talking about an enemy that has no qualms in jailing millions of Uyghurs mm. uh, in yeah, the, the far, far, uh, uh, the far west of uh, China, mm. and destroying whole ethnic groups because their loyalty is doubtful. Now the Hong Kong. Christians are almost all Ch uh, Han, Han Chinese, so there's not the ethnic animosity. But 
if your loyalty is some is to Jesus Christ or to Muhammad or to uh, your Buddhist principles or Confucianism or whatever, that or God forbid, uh, uh, what? Oh, uh, I just forgot the name of that uh, that group who's severely persecuted. Falun Gong, yeah, Falun the Gong, Falun yeah. Gong for practitioners. Mm -hmm. They kill those people. I mean, there have been report credible reports from uh, international human rights groups that Falun Gong parishioners are jailed, executed, and then their organs are harvested and used for transplants. There is no longer reason conversation with communist China, uh, and, and not that there ever was since the, the late uh, mid fifties. But you know, the ability to say, "Hey, can't we just talk about this?" No, there's no talking about this. This is what we're presenting to you. Here is your one singular option. You know, adopt this way forward and your churches will survive. Don't adopt this way forward and your churches will die. If, if I may offer advice, which I'm not hesitant to do, when you go to Walmart, <laughs> when you go to Home Depot, look at where the wrench you're buying is from. You can always find at Home Depot an American alternative. It's going to be more money. But, you know, what's the difference between a $9 and a $14 wrench in the long run when we can basically punish an evil regime and support Americans or Mexicans or people from Taiwan? You know, doesn't necessarily only buy American, but look to see where these things are made and pray for the Chinese people. Pray that that they be freed from the clutches of this evil regime. Righty. Wow, what a great show, guys. Okay, so let's get back here to the North American continent, and we're going to talk about a Toronto diocese is figuring out being in and of the world is not making, and they got some pollsters in there to say, what's going on, George? Diocese of Toronto did a consultation, and they hired a group outside group and they did 450 interviews with rank and file people in the pews and lower level clergy about what do we want the diocese to look like what do we need what do we don't need and this report was recently published by on the diocese of toronto web page and diocese of toronto is like the anglican church of canada it is woke in the extreme uh last toronto story we had was caged Jesus, a homeless statue of Jesus with a cage around it, at it, one of the churches, protesting government plans to move the homeless off the street. Okay. Well, this report said that the people of Toronto, it, it is powerfully said what they wanted. They were young people. They want families with children. They want normal, average Canadians to come to their church. What was absent? Gay pride parades, or all of the woke nonsense. Social justice. <laughs> when asked what they yeah. thought of social justice meant, it wasn't mm. transgender people in wheelchairs, uh, drinking Bud Light, rather. Mm. It was feeding the homeless in their community, providing after school mm. opportunities, meeting the needs of the community, the poor, the downcast around them. Now, there was not an outright condemnation of the woke culture of the Anglican Church of Canada, but the conclusions reached in this study was that they have to pursue faithfulness, they have to pursue the Bible, they have to bring in a new generation of young people, families with children, and it basically is 180 degrees opposite of the uh, direction taken by the officialdom at the Anglican Church of Canada. Yeah. Now, it'll be interesting uh, to see if they actually noise do in the back on That's an F-35 uh, going by. Uh, we're next to the uh, National Guard here, and uh, hope you enjoy are the you uh, sure, patriotic... Are you, sure it's, <laughs> are you sure it's not the Chinese Air Force, Kevin, come to no, take no, no, retribution? No, no, quite sure. Every morning at about 9.30, they, they start up their F-35s, and they take off and go to northern Wisconsin and, and have these little simulations, war simulations out on the Canadian border. Not that they're going to invade uh, uh, Canada, because Canada's part of NORAD, whatever. So I apologize for the interruption. They're gone now. I hope. Um, and but here, here's the thing, George. 
They know the problem. They don't know the solution. They've identified what doesn't work. But I assure you, they don't. nobody's thinking, hey, why don't we return to the gospel? Why don't we start preaching Jesus again? Why don't we you know, uh, return to scripture? Why don't we hire uh, clergy that understand uh, and have a relationship with God and Jesus? In the Holy Spirit. They're not, not the they're not abandoning yeah. they're not abandoning their liberal mindset. Rather, no. they're saying that that is sort of an added luxury that we, we can do. But if we don't do the essentials, we don't have the ability to do the luxuries, which mm-hmm. is, you know, protest Donald Trump's visit or uh <laughs> or make sure we have the best float in the Toronto gay rights parade. Right. Um yeah. it's it's so it remains to be seen if common sense prevails in Toronto. Um, we'll see what happens. Hmm. All right. Another hard topic. Uh, all topics this week are hard. That's the way it is. Uh, you and I, uh, in our off-camera uh, discussions, have talked about kind of the rise of Satanism and the rise of evil in the world. And it's, it's so evident. If we're cutting off the genitals of our children uh, based on feelings, we've hit evil. If we're, you know, if we're allowing uh, this to to happen in our schools here in in America, that is evil. If we're allowing um, uh, by law a right to abortion, that that's evil. It, it's not something new, but it's, I see it rising. I don't see it slowing, George. Yes, the pace of the demonic, in my opinion, is quickening. I could just look at the Episcopal Church. Um, in 1997, at the General Convention, a magazine was published by Trinity Wall Street called Spirituality and Health was distributed to all the delegates, deputies. And nobody reads all these handouts they're given, but somebody read this thing. And one of the articles was from a New York priest who recounted his adventures with his raccoon spirit guide. And some bishop said, what? is this this is satanic and even frank griswold said up had to apologize to the convention for this horrendous scandal now we have the recent installation of the bishop of new york with burning sage and all sorts of new age and kookiness that's not really a recognizably christian service and this sort of syncretism with the spiritual the world spirit of the world which we see with the rise of the gay movement the transgenderism uh we're also seeing it in the secular world with the rise of uh, satanism Mm -hmm. and you know in my community uh there are groups in the high schools you know disaffected young kids who form these little clubs and cults, and some of them get pentagram uh, tattoos, and they go out into the woods and try to invoke spirits. And, you know, it, yeah, it starts with Ouija boards at a sleepover when you're 12, but when you're 17 or 18, it includes hard drugs, slaughtering animals, and giving your life to Satan. Now, not every kid does this, but it is enough, and it is something that the police are aware of. And sometimes I get asked about this because there's a, and in England there was a, a news flutter where a sheep with its throat slit was found in the New Forest. Is this sign of reemergence of paganism? Yes, it is. When Christ is with England, is the most non-Christian, non-religious society in the world. Well, people have a natural religious uh, hole in their heart. And if it's not filled by Christ, it's going to be filled by something else. And Satan does a good job of filling that in. And this evil that we see in so many places um, is is now unashamed. You go into Twitter and you look at like... uh, uh, it's the satanic boastings of people, people in the media, people in sports, people in entertainment. You know, in 97, this was, oh my goodness, what a nut job you are. Today, 
it's almost de rigueur in some circles. Sure. Avant-garde. You know, it, it's it's something up and coming. And, and it's not celebrated yet, but I see one day when we celebrate it uh, uh, openly. Uh, not well, in churches, the, I hope, but certainly, you know, in Hollywood. The BBC, well, the BBC had a recent show about the new Satanism, which was mm. essentially celebrated it as a refreshing alternative to the dreary old Church of England. Oh, okay, it probably is better than the Church of England, you know. And here, the vacuum. Here it has happened. We have a church uh, that is a state church that has lost its way completely, left a vacuum of unanswered questions. Well, the devil's there to help. He has answers. And he's answered the questions of the children, of the young adults, of the uh, young parents, and... Where, where do you restart this church of england mm. well, you started on your knees in prayer and you pray for the conversion of england and i don't mean this in some sort of partisan or sectarian mm. oh well they all join our particular brand of christianity nope. no but pray for the for the holy spirit which is withdrawn from money of the churches of england in the united states and canada and around the world Pray for the world to be filled up again with the power of this. It's Pentecost, for goodness sakes. This is what we should be preaching and hoping and praying happens. That God arises. I've I've had, oh, I shouldn't have mentioned that I went to Rome from a selfish perspective for this training because I've, I have at least a dozen people who've written me with specific instances and problems that I trying to be faithful and responding to and not flippantly, you know, write five lines and say, but, you know, pray about their problem, pray about this. How might I recommend they go forward? And man, there's just such evil and tragedy and hurt out there. Mm. And the only way forward is, I think, is on our knees in prayer and asking God to arise in our hearts. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I may be flippant about the Church of England and other uh, churches around the world in the response in, in the vacuum, but there is an answer, and it's revealed by the Holy Spirit. It's found in Scripture. It's found in the tradition of the Church. It's found in the good news of Jesus Christ. And if you don't know this answer and you, you need some further help, uh, you can find our emails on anglican.inc and we can point you in the right direction. If not, help you individually, but time is always a little scarce in doing so. Okay, what a horrible show. Hopefully Friday's show no, will no. be all good news no, no, and Kevin, flower today, gardens. Well, you we know. have a good... Uh, one of the comments I want to respond to, somebody was, okay. said, oh, you guys are always dumping on AOC. And I want to say we have never once, to my knowledge, mentioned Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in this show. Uh, I don't well, know I what they're have, we, I think we may have mentioned just maybe something she said about Trump. But um, if you go back a couple, I, I know we, she has been mentioned, but I don't think in a derogatory light. You know. Now, perhaps they're thinking of the Archbishop of Canterbury, but he's the ABC. AOC. <laughs> he's ABC. He's not the yeah. AOC. Now, AOC yeah. is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, not Justin yeah. Welby. And yeah. notice we haven't, this is the first time we've mentioned his name today. Who? Just knew? What? Vacuum. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 804 of Anglican Unscripted.